So Seamus, I noticed there's not much content on the blog, so I hope your book is progressing well. Can you hear the absolutely overwhelming sound of guilt coming from me? Because that's basically all I feel these days. Aww. I just, it drives me crazy to not have posts for the blog. Like, you know, I'll be like, oh, I can't stand this. And I'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get content up soon. And everybody's like, eh, don't worry about it. You know, you can miss a day. It's no big deal. Come back when you're ready. But it actually drives me crazy to, like, not have. It's even part of my daily workflow. Like, okay, I'm going to check the comments. Oh, wait, I didn't do a post. There are no comments. Weird. And then I'm just, like, frozen. Like, I don't know what to do with this 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so that's going to a trance, right? I mean, that's not far from the truth. I get stuck in this weird loop where I keep feeling like I need to like do work on, you know, check comments or whatever. And then I realize there aren't any and I'm like, well, what's the next thing on my list? Oh, check comment. No, uh, write some blog. Oh, I'm working on the book, write the book. So this is the part of the project that I hate on the book. <clears throat> I'm supposedly done. So we have to fork it. Mm. We have to, we have a point in the project where it's time to format it for our two targets. You know, one is ebook, one is print. Oh, right. And now, of course, you know, I fork it and Heather handles the print version. And, and she better not find any typos. Right? I know, but I'm going to be handling the electronic version. And I know I'm going to find typo. And so oh, now. No. Oh, I hate it. I hate it. So now fixing double typos. But of course, what if while fixing one of them, you create one in one of the two documents? Oh, and I just wrote like I added on some stuff in Andromeda. I don't know what came over me. My last day of working on it, I like banged out like half an article worth just, you know, several paragraphs on a topic that I thought I'd skimmed over in the original series. And I was like, oh, this is really good, you know, add some detail. But then I realized that that's, you know, a thousand words that needs proofing. <laughs> I mean, I read, right? So I read through it and it looks good, but I know I'm going to go back to, I'm going to look at it next time I sit down to work on the book. I'm going to find four typos in there and then have to fix them in two places. Because oh, cause that's, that's words that no one has ever read like not the readers right. on the blog none of the proofers brand new right i'm the only one to have read them barely <laughs> I, I write this stuff i don't expect you to read it so this is the worst part of the pro i mean it, it's nice we're coming down to the end of it you know getting this out of the way and i'll be able to start putting stuff on the blog so this needs to get done but boy do i hate this part you know Anytime you fork a code base, it's like, oh, oh, I have to double all my changes. This sucks. Yeah, and coordinate things, and oh, it's, it's the worst. So, please tell me you've been doing something better than that this week. Um, barely. I've been doing accounting kind of stuff, too. Uh, I talked several months ago on the blog or in the podcast about uh, um, Google's what it, Google Poly is shutting down, and a lot of people have never even heard of it. Um, but it's a, a web hosting thing for uh, 3D models, 3D model thing Google was doing. But they're right. shutting it down, and so I need to find a new place to to host my my 3D models because. I do 3D model commissions and it's really nice to have a showcase of like, here's some actual 3D models that you can view on the web, you know, someone can pull up on their phone or on their browser or whatever. Uh, so they don't have to install Blender or whatever, you know, install some sort of 3D modeling thing and download a file. They can just go to the page, spin some models around and be like, oh, that's cool. So I right. like having 3D models on the web somewhere. And uh, I was thinking about doing it myself. I was like, oh, well, I could just like get some sort of app or like install a thing on my website and it was just it was just turning into a nightmare so i looked around and it turns out that sketchfab i i didn't look into the history of it but it seems like sketchfab is either the site that google poly got their ideas from because a lot of the interface is pretty similar or they it went the other way maybe they were like oh google's doing this poly thing let's just pull a bunch of their their things in but it's actually nicer than google poly and so i put up a bunch of 3d models there and there'll be some link in, uh, link in the show notes if Seamus thinks it's worth linking to. And uh, yeah, you can spin some models around. And they have a ton of stuff. They've got, there are a lot, um, museums all over the world that have 
posted a bunch of stuff for free, you know, all these ancient artifacts. They've done photo scans of them and put them up on, on theirs and you can download them. Uh, just incredible stuff. There's a huge wealth of 3D models up there. So if you're interested in 3D models, check out Sketchfab. It's pretty sweet. I um I, I bet I've seen I I looked through your collection here and of course it's mostly stuff I've seen before that you've listed elsewhere, yeah. But I didn't notice your tetrahedral planetoid before. I think I've seen it, but I never zoomed in on it. This is an interesting model. That is I, uh, one of my one of my favorite pieces. That's it's by uh, by Escher by M C Escher. He didn't make the three D model, but right. he, he did the design, and uh, I digitized that. Oh man, like a decade ago. It's really groovy. I'll try to remember to link it in the show notes. Thanks. I yeah, I like it too. So neither of us have done any gaming this week, I guess. I'm nearly done gaming. I've watched gaming. Oh, okay. That's I mean it kind of counts, right? So I watched some StarCraft 2 games. And it's just, you know, it's easy to slide back into that. You know, it's been a couple years since the last time I paid attention to StarCraft 2. And so there's a bunch of tournaments, and it's really nice when you do things this way, because you can just watch the best of moments. Everybody's like, oh, that one game nine months ago. And I can just watch <laughs> that one, you know, infamous match between these two titans that finally saw each other in a, in a tournament. And their epic battle where they were just neck and neck for several rounds and the games all went long and it went to the final game and it was great. Those are all, you know, as opposed to, you know, once in a while you get a tournament that kind of ends lame. It's really one-sided. It's all, you know, it's all just like the same, the same three Korean guys. Like, much love to those guys. <laughs> they are very talented. But, you know, it's like the Patriots winning every year. It's like, uh, I was hoping for something different. Right. A little switch up. Right. So I can watch all those little switch up moments or all those little weird comebacks. And, and uh, that's been a lot of fun catching up on a great match. On, on the great matches I've missed. I will say that tournaments in the age of COVID are super duper weird. Yeah. <laughs> No live crowd, or did he even right. sitting in the same room? Nope. It's everybody streaming from home. So it's like this Ugh. big official match, but you're like, you know, here's this top tier Korean player, and in the background is just his unmade bed. And I'm like, <laughs> come on, man. I want I, I to imagine that, you know, you're playing from your yacht or something, and not your parents', you know, basement. <laughs> I would have dreamed Aww. that you guys are like hitting it big and I mean some of yeah, these guys yeah. do make a lot of money But you know, it is just sort of funny disheveled bed or just like a bunch of clutter or a, You know a cluttered desk behind them. Also, it's even half weirder of a because, bookshelf, right? Right. It's even weirder because they want the casters the casters show up on camera between matches, but they're not mm. there. So what they do is they have the casters stand in front of a green screen and then they ah. project them into the same space and then they put a virtual table in front of them so it seems like they're both standing at the same table. And it sure. is absolutely not convincing in the slightest. <laughs> the uncanny valley of virtual presence. Oh, it is the worst. I They even do it like they want everybody to stand at an L-shaped desk with like the main person and then there's an angle and then there's the other two people on the long part of the L, mm -hmm. right? Right, right. So they've got the, the, they're just sort of rendering these people to polygons. So they're like, they're these 2D people <laughs> just sort of floating oh, wait, what? their upper bodies. They're not bodies. even filming them at an angle? No, it's just they film themselves straight on and then they project it behind a table. It's only at a oh, slight no. angle. It's only at a slight angle, but boy, you can tell. You can tell this is just a, you know, a cardboard cutout <laughs> of two people, a moving cardboard cutout. It feels so weird. And I'm like, you should just, you know, have everybody in gamer chairs, just face cam. You know, just basically let yeah, us yeah. sit in. Tell them to Zoom unmake meeting. their bed so they'll fit in with everyone else. <laughs> right, exactly. But they're like, you know, in nice shirts in front of, you know, superimposed onto this glowing blue background. And it just, oh, 
It is the worst. It is so bad. I like fast forward through it every time because it's so, it just sort of is embarrassing how bad it looks. And they never look at each other. They never have any banter right. or whatever because they're not actually there. And they also have, during the games, you know, they're in basically a Google Hangout or whatever. So they have mm -hmm. vocal lag. So you get them, you know, like you and I do, sometimes we'll talk at the same time or talk over each other. Stuff that doesn't happen when you're face to face. And so yeah, that's an you can't extra read the body layer. language. Yeah, and the, and right. the latency. Right, the lack of body language and the, and the slight latency. It only takes a quarter second. And you'll both start, and then you'll both stop, and then you, oh, who's going to go? Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is awkward. Um, I did not expect this in a StarCraft turn. I mean, you'd think, oh, you just don't have an audience, and, you know, everybody can be in a separate booth. But, I mean, it just costs so much to fly everybody to the same location. And then if you're just going to isolate everybody in a booth anyway, it's like, well, everybody might as well stay at home. <laughs> yeah. Save on I mean, who wants to fly in a plane during a pandemic and stay in a hotel? Probably not right. many people. Yeah, yeah. Still, that was crazy. It was really funny looking. Hmm. Yeah, it seems weird that they would go through all that effort to make it look worse than it would look normally. They probably imagined, oh, we're going to make it look like they're all here. This will be so convincing. And it... Ah. Okay, here. L let me show you the link. Here, here, check this out, Paul. This is what they look like to the desk. And I'll link this in the show notes. Oh, no. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, because it's clearly a virtual environment. I thought they would have, like, right. some sort of photo of a studio or something. No, no. It's uh, somebody's, my first Blender environment. It's not even at the right, like, angle. It's, you know, the, it makes it look like they're either way yeah. too big or too tiny. And it's just so Yeah, weird. they look too small. Right. And they should be sitting down behind that desk, but there's no desk. Like, it's too short to be a desk. So they right. have to be standing. And then they're, like, rocking back and forth. So it's clear that they're standing when they should be sitting down. Or, like, one of them sitting down and the other one's standing. I don't understand. <laughs> I understand why anyone thought this was a good idea. Right. Uh, maybe somebody pictured it looking really cool in their head. Like, no, we'll make a cool virtual environment. I mean, so they could have run them through a filter and turn them into, like, glowing green wireframe or something. And then it would have been like, oh, yeah, sweet. They're, like, virtual people or whatever. They're, they're in the net. Right. But no, it's just, like, green screen on top of it. No, guys, please stop. This reminds me of when Winter Starcraft... Winter Starcraft likes to do... He, he's a Starcraft streamer. And he likes to take his image of him in his gamer chair. You know, he's got a webcam during his stream. But then he switches to all these views so that it looks like his gamer chair is riding in the back of a salt truck when he's talking about somebody being salty. It's like, you know, a winter <laughs> right, salt right. truck. And he's in the back of the salt truck. And I forget, he's got a whole bunch of them. He's got one of him sitting in a spawning, in a StarCraft II spawning pool for Zerglings. Oh, like, sure. He's, he's got a whole bunch of them and he just switches to them every once in a while. And he's, you know, animated talking to you. But he's talking to you from this face. But it's a joke. It It's supposed to look stupid and photoshopped and everything. But this looks just like it, except serious. Yeah. It's it's It'd like, be, the, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of those animated 3D model transitions they do at the football games or whatever, when they're going from the field to the guys in the announcer booth. And it's all, like, tons of greebles and flashy and stuff. But, like... This is just the transition. They're just like sitting in the transition graphics. <laughs> right. It doesn't transition to the real world. It's just them projected into that weird. Oh, I keep so expecting weird. this big silver cup to kind of like whoosh across the screen to do the wipe fade, but no, no right. nothing happens. Oh, well. I, you'd really think that someone would have figured out like video editing technology. You'd think, but maybe it's super hard. Yeah, it seems super hard for Blender, but Blender's tools are, are not great for, for editing video, which um, I actually I followed your suggestion this last week and tried out DaVinci Resolve. And how'd it go? It was pretty good. Um, it, I mean, the first thing that is different, of course, is that it's a commercial software that they're offering you a free version of, and so they've got like 
the, there's the page where you download it, right? And it's like, here's all the features. And then here's all the pro features that you're missing out on. And then here's all the editing consoles you could buy for like $20,000. I'm like, man, he really quick on the upsell there. <laughs> right, we went from zero to 20K real quick here. So I downloaded the thing and it's like three gigs. That's the other difference, right? Blender is like 50 megabytes or something insanely small, maybe 100 megabytes now. Um, but no, DaVinci Resolve is like gigabytes of download, and so it takes forever. And uh, then it installs, and it's got like all these Microsoft executable uh, runtime things it's got to install, and then it installs DaVinci Resolve, and then it has to install more runtime executable libraries. And I'm just like, oh right. man, it's this whole it's this whole production of of like installers installing other installers. Uh, and then at the end, <laughs> did the most ridiculous thing. It's like now. You need to restart your computer in order to use this software. I'm like, no, I don't. Get out of town. That's nonsense. I didn't restart my computer. And it still worked just fine. There's no there's no need huh. to restart your computer, guys. Wow. After installing all the crap and it worked fine. That's cool. Yeah. I, I, I'm assuming that there's some sort of like thing where it like integrates with your hardware that you've bought from them or something. And you have to restart your computer so it can register all the hardware. And the, I don't know. I don't know what it's trying to do. But edited video just fine without restarting so i uh, i was really impressed i got it up and running the other the other weakness compared to blender other than the download time is um that it takes like 18 seconds to start up or whatever whereas blender is maybe three but uh other than oh, that it Blender's blows blender instant. out of the water yeah. yeah yeah blender's so fast blender's like notepad it just starts <laughs> it's like oh the I gotta wait for this splash. Oh, this isn't the splash screen. This is just the program waiting for me to use it. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like that comedy bit where someone mentions a servant and he pops in. You called? Right. So, uh, but otherwise, DaVinci Resolve is supremely superior uh, as far as video editing. It's really smooth. It edits really quickly. All the stuff works like you want it instead of doing exactly what you tell it. And uh, it's got a whole audio EQ setup in there. You can edit audio and fade in, fade out, speed up, slow down, all kinds of, uh, you, know, you can do automatic EQ and, and balancing and fading and awesome. spatial controls. And oh, yeah. And it's so fast. Yeah. I, I think Finally. it rendered at like two or three times real time. To, to full HD. Yeah. I finally, this is a feature I've wanted on the show for ages, is I want my voice to be like five semitones lower with lots of reverb and echo effects onto <laughs> it. And just, Isaac keeps insisting that he can't make that happen. So I think we're finally going to have it because I think that's that's what this show needs to really push, push us, you know, to the next level. Just make me sound like on a the podcast or on that. your videos. Yes, all both. Yeah, yeah. run them right would... through the demon filter. Right, I should sound like Harbinger from the Mass Effect games. <laughs> and just this hurts you. Yeah, it, that would be pretty fun. I tried it. I tried to edit my voice. It didn't work so well, so I just kind of gave Oops. up. But um, it also has it like an upload straight to YouTube thing, which is just crazy. Like, I, of course it does, yeah. but like, wow. Who would use that? Like, who doesn't want to, like, look at the video before they upload? I see stuff like that all the time. Like, uh, in the music, every music program I've ever used has been, like, upload to whatever the sharing site of, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is among music sharing sites. Yeah. It's like, you know, just a checkbox, like, Okay, you're going to save it, and you're going to upload it to Audio Cloud or whatever, right? And I'm like, no, let's uh, let's listen to the result first before we, before we fire it off into the into the into the information superhighway for the world to see. Let's check our work. Uh, you don't trust your tools, huh? My tools make mistakes all the time. I gotta I gotta keep an eye on them. Like all the mm. typos Google Docs keeps putting into my book. <laughs> Well, at least it doesn't have DRM. That's that's a really nice this is a nice change. Speaking of DRM, okay, so I've been playing Factorio recently, and um, I've said before I, I usually listen to like electronic music, no, no vocals, right? I do not want talking in my mm. music, but yeah, I don't same. mind when I'm playing. Yeah, but I don't mind when I'm playing Factorio because, you know, there is no 
the game requires no reading and nobody talks to you. So there is no mm -hmm. vocal element, right? So I was like, you know, it's been like 15 years since the last time I listened to They Might Be Giants. And I'm a huge fan of They Might Be Giants. Like, I love the music, but it's just, you know, I can never listen to it because I can't listen to it while I'm programming or writing. You know, that's mm, just... Right. So, <laughs> those are the only times I listen to music. So, I, but I'm like, all right, I'm playing Factorio. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to They Might Be Giants. And I went to get, you know, I've got a bunch of their albums saved on my hard drive. And I went to my copy of Lincoln, and for whatever reason, it only had one song on it. Like, I bought... Lincoln's one of their earliest albums. It's like early 80s. Um, and only one track. Like, I probably bought it online years ago, but I only bought one track. <laughs> one track like, for 10 bucks or whatever. <laughs> right, right. Well, and I was like, but I want I want to listen to the whole album. I want to just put the whole album on repeat. That's, that's what I want. Hmm. And uh, so I like, well, okay, where can I buy it? Oh, Amazon Music. And you can buy it on Amazon Music and then listen to it through Amazon's built-in web player. And it's like, come on. If I can't take it out of your ecosystem, then I'm not buying it. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, you're renting it at best. Right. Right. This is the mobile home where I own... The, I own the thing, but I don't own the property the thing exists on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and I'm like, come on, there's got to be a way to buy. And then just searching around, I found They Might Be Giants website. Just they sold it direct through their website. And I'm like, you got to be kidding. Oh, nice. Just direct MP3 download. Boom. Bought it. Get, now, this is, the, I think, the third time I've bought this album. But I didn't mind. <laughs> I don't mind because I know, for one thing, most of that's going to the band and not going to be absorbed by SoundCloud or Google Play or Amazon or some other big company. Sure, and, uh, Apple or whatever. Right. And I get to download the MP3s, and now they're on my hard drive for good. That's right. You can put them in a paper sack and take them home with you. Right? And I just, that just felt so good. If I'd had to buy this and then figure out how to rip it, or like break the DRM <laughs> so that I could play, listen, use my music player that I use for all my music, which just plays uh -huh. MP3s off my heart. That's what I want. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to open up Audacity, turn it to loop back through your Yeti and right. record the song while it's playing and hope no one messages you in the middle of it. And then add all the tags to the resulting MP3 and trim it up and balance uh, the volume. Yeah. Oh, yuck. I mean, I probably would have done that, but it would have made me angry. But no. No DRM. Boom. I bought it. Now I need to get Flood again. This will definitely be the third time I've purchased Flood. I know it. The fourth. <laughs> I purchased Flood um, the first time on cassette. Then that <sighs> my car got stolen and that no. cassette got destroyed. So I bought the cassette again. And then I bought a CD and... I mean, I technically, the CD is probably still somewhere here in the house, but, like, who knows where it could be. So I'm probably going to buy Flood again. Yeah, you've probably not unpacked it for the past two moves. Right. <laughs> right. I know I have a bunch of music CDs and I haven't seen any of them in a couple moves. Who knows where they could be. In with a bunch of baby clothes nobody remembers we still have for some reason. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Well, speaking of things for babies, I played Never Out this past week. Okay. Uh, you, I see here in the show notes you have it listed as build as an antechamber successor, which I thought, all right, that could be cool. And I'm like watching the trailer here on Steam. But give me the dirt. Is this thing any good? What's it like? Um, Like I said, it's, it's about the right speed for my five-year-old son. Oh... So it looks like a real puzzle game here on uh, on Steam. It looks like, oh, okay, these look like real puzzles. But no, it's it's pretty simplistic. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's too hard for my four-year-old. So, but it was too easy for me. Like, like I would look at the room. So, so it's um, it's a what gravity changing? It's like it's like manifold garden where you go to a surface and then you can like change so that that surface is down. Right. 
um, but it's designed for VR, and so the desktop play is not great. Like you, you click to there's it's just a one button interface. You click the left mouse button, and you move the mouse around, and that's that's the whole game. And then when you click, it moves you one square forward, um, and uh. so you're constantly you know click 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 click, and then you like turn. If you want to go diagonal, you have to like go forward and then go sideways, and, and so that's not great. Ooh. And the puzzles are not it, it's all in a room that's i think um maybe 10 by 10 squares or 10 by 10 by 10 is a cube room all the rooms are exactly the same size um and so it's easy to see the whole puzzle at once which is cool because you can see the whole puzzle at once but then you can also solve the puzzle without moving and then it's just a matter of executing it uh, which is also doesn't feel great like that was right. one of the amazing things about about the witness was you had to be able to see it in order to to execute it and and so like you're always moving around and being like oh well, maybe it'll work from this angle maybe it'll work from that angle maybe i'm i'm not seeing it right here or you know like you're always changing your perspective and trying to figure out where the puzzle is if that makes sense whereas this one is like the puzzle is the room that you're in and you can see the whole thing and then once you solve it you have to click 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 and a number of the puzzles are like the block is here and you need to be on the other side of this little wall, but you can't move the block. You can only turn the room. So you have to walk all the way the long way around the room to get it to like fall oh. all the way around the room to get back to where you were. No. And it's like, okay, yeah. I can see I can see where this is coming from. Um, but I'm not super engaged. So yeah, I I don't know what the what the skinny of the the marketing was. I bought it kind of on an impulse because it's only four bucks and like, hey, for four bucks, sure. I'll, I'll give you a chance. Sure. Yeah, I did see it was real cheap. I almost bought it, but then I thought... I almost bought it as soon as I saw it in the show notes, but I was like, I should listen to Paul's segment before I put down my $4. <laughs> and yeah. I'm glad I did. The, the cutest thing about it, I think, is the exit screen where... You remember back in, um, what was it, Alpha Centauri, where you'd exit the game and it's like, don't leave, the drones need right. you. They look up to you. <laughs> Yes. And back in the 90s, right, all the all the exit things had, like, you know, funny little please don't leave or whatever buttons on them. Right. So in Never Out, uh, when you say exit the game, it brings up a screen that says, do you actually want to leave? And it says, the, one of the buttons instead of cancel says never. And the other one says out. I was like, oh, that's very <laughs> clever. Good job. That's fun. So I told you last week that our car had died the death. Yeah, you're going to haul it off to the, the charnel house. It actually, I mean, it was a shame because, like, we drove it home. You know, Heather, you know, we said, okay, we're, we're not going to pay the value of this car to fix the car. And then we just mm. went and picked it up and Heather drove it home. But then, uh, and it just broke my heart. Like, this thing works. It just, the automatic transmission just doesn't know what gear it's supposed to be in. So while you're going up a hill, it just keeps switching between first and second. And, you know, sometimes you get stuck in third. Okay. This seems like, this seems like just something needs to be tightened. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. But no, apparently just the whole car needs to be thrown away. But we did find some service that would actually give us real money for it. They gave us almost a thousand oh, wow. for it. So oh, that well, made yeah. me feel good, not just because we get money, but because if they're paying for it, that means they're going to get use of, like somehow th this car is going to become an organ donor for other cars. And that, <laughs> right, right. They're going to pull parts out of it or whatever. Right. And that made me feel so much better. Like we're not throwing away an entire good car for lack of one part. And so that like... Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like you make a Thanksgiving oh. turkey and then you're like, you notice that there's a cat hair on it and you're just like, chuck it in the bin. <laughs> right. Right. The whole thing and the mashed potatoes and the stuffing, uh, everything into the bin. <laughs> it looks like we're having toast tonight, everybody. <laughs> um, so I, I just instantly felt better. That whole thing made me feel better that this car isn't getting thrown away and will be used and boy, that was just, it didn't, <clears throat> I didn't even realize how bad that was bugging me until, until we got that sorted out. And I was like, oh, that's so much nicer. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know the feeling. We, we just did our taxes and 
as I mentioned, we were in the middle of a move and in the move, we misplaced all our tax documents. We had collected them all before we moved and we're like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna not lose these and then we lost them. And so there was like a month where we're just like, we don't know where the tax documents are. And I didn't realize how badly it was bothering me until we finally actually went and got our taxes done. And then I was like, oh, I can breathe again. Oh, that's so nice. Right. right. So we got a new car. Oh, already. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't bad. It was, uh, well, it, buying it sucked. You can't, okay, the town I live in is a steel making town. And people mm. around here like their American cars. And they like yeah, their big course. trucks and SUVs. And that's the last thing we want. You know, we are now, <laughs> it's just me. Oh, so there's my tons wife. of used pickup trucks everywhere. Exactly. And that stuff's all real cheap. But, you know, those are right for people that know how to work on vehicles and have some skill. You know, we need something that is reliable. <laughs> you know, something in, made in, in Japan. Yes, exactly. And we need something with really phenomenally good gas mileage because Heather is now driving a long way. She has almost an hour commute now. She's got a really oh, good wow. job. She's oh, she, that's good. Yeah, she's a nanny for a very successful family, as I guess we'll we'll put it that way. Hmm. And that was her. That was like how she got into this nanny gig. Is you know there was this basically this family of tycoons, yeah. the local tycoons that own <laughs> half the town, and she was like, they had their matriarch, and she was ninety four years old, and Heather was one of her caregivers. But you know oh, wow. you get in with you get in with the right people, and you become notable for being trustworthy and discreet, and and that kind of gets you into the circle. And it gets easier to find jobs from there. And then all of a sudden you're in crazy demand. And you can afford to and buy a Toyota. Right. Well, that's what we did. We uh, we bought a Prius. I've oh, never hey. owned. Yeah. I've never owned a hybrid before. We've never, you know, we just have normal gas guzzlers. And, but this thing had like, you know, 40 miles to the gallon. And I'm like, well, that sounds pretty friggin' good. Yeah. I mean, you run the numbers when you drive for like 50 minutes, you know, you run those numbers and, you know, the difference between getting 30 miles to the gallon and 40 miles to the gallon ends up being thousands of dollars a year. So Yeah, it does. It I, really, I commuted an hour both ways to work for a couple of years. And yeah, you're like, oh, man, I should get an electric car. I got to got to figure out some way to game this. It is really weird. This was my first experience in a... Now, it's not a full... This isn't like a Tesla where it's just, you know, all all electric. It's a hybrid. But it right, is right. weird because... I've, I've actually driven a Prius before. One of the, the oh. people who... Anyway, yeah. Yeah, so I found it really weird when she turned on the car and it was on, but it's not doing anything and it's not making any right. noises. It's not <laughs> it's vibrating just, properly. Right? It's like, no, no, no. We're, we've got explosions going on under the hood, and we've got, like, this huge metal casing to keep the explosions contained so we can harness their energy. <laughs> but none of that's <laughs> going on. There are no explosions going on inside this car. Well, then, then, the, then the engine kicks on just to charge the battery. But, wow. And it is, it's a very nice car. I, I really like it. This is also the first time we've ever financed a car we've always just bought a used car with cash we've never financed a car oh, right before. yeah yeah and yeah we're gonna be paying for this thing for the next few years but that's like normal that's what most people do most people right. don't just like have you know all right well we got a couple thousand dollars let's see what how much car we can get for for whatever we've got in the coffee can yeah and a lot of people finance brand new cars because they're not that <laughs> expensive. Right. Uh, this is a um, seven years old. Yeah, not bad at all. For a Prius, those things last a long time, don't they? Yeah, that's what we heard. That's another reason we wanted a Prius. Um, is because they supposedly last a really long time. And uh, yeah, happy so far. I mean, this is Heather's car. I don't drive to work. I walk across <laughs> the hall to work. <laughs> You know, get up in, in the morning, shower, shave, walk out the door, get in this car, 
pull out of the driveway, pull back into the driveway, go back in the house. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, here's a funny thing. April 1st joke. There were two jokes on April 1st. One is that it snowed. Ooh. So, so that was that was that one had me not laughing. Got up in the morning on April 1st, looked outside, and I was like, is this some kind of joke? Well, it is the right day for it, I guess. <laughs> And then it was spring. Nope, April Fools. Right, and then we went to buy this car. And oh, like I was saying earlier, you, you can't buy Japanese cars around here. The only places that deal with them, you've got to go to Pittsburgh. So this was a fifty-minute mm. drive to buy this car, and the weather was all right when we set out. This was April first again, and okay, that snowstorm blew away. All right, ha ha. Everybody had their laugh. We drive all the way to Pittsburgh. And then the snowstorm comes back and it sits there and snows on us while we're waiting to buy this car. <laughs> and then we get out there. We get out. The place we got out the door just as the place was closing. So the the dealership is now closed and Heather and I are in the parking lot and we realize we've got to clean our cars off. They are, actually have accumulated snow and underneath the snow is real ice. Uh -huh. And yep. The new car does not have a scraper in it. <laughs> of course it doesn't. And uh, so, so here we've got this, you know, $10,000 machine that we can't use for a lack of a $5 piece of plastic. And, oh, I drove my mom's car there, and I couldn't find her scraper either. And I thought, oh, no, did she take it out? She was like, oh, it's spring. And so I was out there cleaning the windshield with my sleeve and, you know, getting snow up my sleeve and just having a really rotten time. And like, oh, figures. Oh, we've all been there. You didn't have a spare so credit card you could scrape it off with or something? Um... Yeah, I don't know. That was tough ice. I, Heather did find a scraper. It was a stupid little one, not a big proper one. But Oh, yeah. What we, it was we, like four inches long or whatever. Right. But we got the car cleaned off and we, we got out of there. So, But that was just, that was a weird April 1st for us. Yeah, wow. Um, yeah. So, let's do some mailbags. Yeah, let's round out the show. You go ahead with the first one. Hi. I don't know if you watched the gameplay reveal for Six Days in Fallujah. Probably not. I'm tossing aside the genre and uh, themes for the time being, but there was one moment closer to the end, around the 144 second mark, there's a link, where they demonstrated the proc gen generation. Proc, proc gen... Proc gen not just for the individual rooms, but also for the whole map of a district. I know that you, Seamus, are a big proponent of this approach, and I wonder how do you feel about the implementation of the technology here, at least? from what was shown in the release trailer. Best regards, Deadly Dark. P.S. Still in shock that dozens of years later, I finally see this title released. Thank you, Deadly Dark. Right, so I don't follow military shooters. And I, I was actually thinking about this before the show. Every time I see a military shooter based on real-world events, I'm like, ugh, ugh, yuck. And th then this afternoon, I was thinking about this, reading this question. I'm like, wait a minute, this didn't used to bug me. I mean, I played the hell out of World War II simulators, never had a problem with that. Vietnam games, never had a problem with that. Well, I'm a little nervous because Vietnam's a pretty touchy subject. But, you know, I wasn't like, no, nobody should ever make a video game about this. Wolfenstein, why do I... totally historical. Yeah, it's practically a documentary. Um... So why do I have this weird feeling when I see modern games? And I realize my problem isn't that I don't think... Um, it's not that I think there's anything wrong with adapting real-world wars into a video game. It's that I have absolutely no confidence. Like, I hate that Activision is doing it. That's the part that bugs me. Mm, right. Right. And that's... And just... Oh, it makes me cringe so hard. Um, but this game, I don't know the lineage of this game. My f shock when, when Deadly Dark sent this in, I was like, Six Days in Fallujah? Wait a minute, didn't that come out like 10 years ago? But apparently not. It's just been stuck in development for so long. Um, oh, yes, wow. the proc gen 
generation looks super interesting. I don't know if, I mean, it makes me want to play the game, but then, you know, I'm watching the gameplay footage and it's, I'm not even sure, is this a team-based game? Is this online? I don't understand how it works. I don't know. Yeah, you could probably just watch some streams or something. Watch? Turning into Coach Z. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the deal is with the, I mean, the whole thing makes me uncomfortable, but again, if this was made, but, you know, I just sort of assume, oh, this is, this is a big corporation cashing in on the local, on the, on, you know, ripped from the headlines stuff. And that makes me cringe. But then again, maybe not. I don't even know who's publishing this. I don't know who made it. I don't remember because it's been so long since the last time I heard from the, heard of this game. In fact, I'm going to look it up right now. So, yeah, this is published by Victura. Like, who? Never heard of them. It, this is a... This is not by the big... This is not by one of the big publishers. Mm. And um, it's not by a developer I've heard before. And it's mode single player and multiplayer. I might actually check this out. I'm not super big on you know. I want my I want my shooting games to be very fantastical, real world shooting, where human beings shoot each other. Just I I don't enjoy it. You know, it's not like woo yeah. I totally shot those people. Just doesn't make me feel good. <laughs> I'm not condemning anybody that enjoys any of this stuff. I'm just saying, for me, not super into it. But the proc gen environments and the fact that this seems to be a labor of love on the part of the developers makes me want to check it out. So I might do that. Oh, yeah, the game was originally slated for a 2010 release, but it was canceled due to controversy. Okay, understandable. The game was put on hold until 2016 after its original studios went bankrupt in 2011. So wow, this thing has a has a long and complicated history. Wow. Oh, and it's being made by former Halo and Destiny developers. Hmm. I I have to check this out because it's so weird now. Does it say what we'll engine it's in or do they roll their own? I don't it doesn't say in this article. That is very interesting. Um, just from the, the release footage, it looked like the proc gen they're doing is like um, moving walls around and like putting different parapets yeah. around the top of the buildings and things like that. Probably doing uh, like environmental scatter and stuff, which I mean, it's a real proc gen. It, it looks interesting, but it's not right, like they're doing not... uh, uh, what like spore kind of stuff where it's like right. completely different environments. It's like you're still in Fallujah. Right. Uh, hopefully you're going to. You know, after you play the game for, a, you know, you are you play through the game a few times and you're going to start to have those moments where you're like, oh, right, this room again. Oh, I've seen hmm. this one before. You know, oh, this place. Oh, yeah, I know how this works. Well, like, yeah, hopefully they didn't just like do Tinker Toys with whole rooms, but right. uh, that's possible too. And yeah, it's certainly the assets, it seems like, are going to be showing up over and over again. Right, exactly. So it'll start to look familiar, but um, oh, it's just so interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, I I understand why it's controversial, and maybe some people will be offended that it exists, and that's fine. But now I'm just sort of really interested, like, oh, this is a weird, this is a weird, a hot-button game not made because it's a hot-button game. It's just, you know, made by people who were there, who wanted to make a game about it for some reason and then it got when in the development hell went bankrupt came out of it as a proc gen game i i really have to check that out that's weird a game that was made because it just wouldn't die <laughs> right dear diecast while cruising around the information superhighway apparently this person surfing the net in 1993 <laughs> I ran into a neat little project called Pixels. They're making neat LED dice that you can program to create neat effects. While meetups for some dice rolling are still going to be a couple of months out, I thought you might like it. Veil Tim. Yeah, so wow, if I was still doing tabletop gaming, I would be all over this. 
They're light up, di they're dice that glow. They reach, you know, they're sealed. So you recharge them um, wirelessly and you Ooh. control them with your phone. But you can change the lights in them and make them do different things. And the first mm. thing I wondered is okay, that's really cool. But um, of course, now you have all those electronics in there. Hey, where's the battery? Is that perfectly balanced? Or are you going to uh -huh. end up with, with it? And no, they they actually thought about that. And they, they the dice compare favorably to game science dice. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the really super picky for people who want dice that are very, very fair. Like, if you just want looks, you can get chess X dice, which are sort of notorious for being a little bit wobbly. Like, yeah. they're slightly un irregular. And over time, you know, you roll it 10,000 times and track the numbers and you'll see some some non-trivial deviations in probabilities. But then if you get like game science dice as like very, very even, very fair dice and pixels can compares favorably to the game science dice. So these things are not like wonky with the battery, you know, under the 20 or something. <laughs> Um, and they yeah. have their own case that's also a charger that's like Darth Vader's capsule or whatever. Right. Oh, they look so cool. I love them. I might get this as a Christmas gift for my brother. That's what that might be. Like. Oh, and he'll tell your phone what number you rolled so you don't even have to look at it. <laughs> it's like, I would never stop looking at this dice. Why would I need that feature? <laughs> And really, it would be game, so cool, right? You could roll them like over your shoulder. You could just toss the dice over your shoulder into the room. As a game master, that would get on my nerves because I don't want anybody to have an excuse to keep looking at their phone during the game. Uh, my <laughs> games, my Fair. games were pre pre smartphone, right? Smartphones were not a thing for peasants back in two thousand five and two thousand six when I was running games. Yeah, but but yeah, like. These days, I'll bet you that's a big problem at a table, is people on their phone, like, oh, everybody else is talking to the bartender, my character has nothing to do, I'll get out my phone and screw around, and then it brings the game to a halt. Um, yeah, I I did the same thing back in the day with, like, you know, sketch pads and laptops and stuff. Probably wasn't the best RPG player. <laughs> right? Sorry, all table mates out there. I, I wasn't a great, I wasn't a great guy to play with. Me neither. My, my, my games were always like three hours of narration about where food comes from. <laughs> I know no one's asking this, but I really want to know what they, what they eat. <laughs> all right, you guys come upon another wheat field. Yeah, we want to keep going north. Okay, it's another wheat field. We want to keep going north. It's more wheat fields. <laughs> Look, I'm just reflecting. This is what the this is what it would be like during this time period. And we're looking for a place to buy swords. It's all farmers. None of them have swords. <laughs> right? Why would these people have swords? Are they going to fight their own cows? Come on. I wonder if these guys could make like a smart sword that you could like swing and it would generate a random number for you. <laughs> That's a stupid idea. I love it. Put it on Kickstarter. It's a sword. You just, every time you give it a little swing, it just displays a number on the hilt or something. And just everybody at the table swinging these foam swords around, bonking each other, knocking over drinks. <laughs> oh, the drinks. No. I regret everything. <laughs> Do a Kickstarter video of people doing that, but talk about how great it is and show them, <laughs> like, bashing each other in the face, <laughs> knocking over drinks. <laughs> oh, wait, miniatures you can put just flying everywhere <laughs> somebody swinging his sword but he needs to get new put new batteries in it oh, no. uh, and they make that terrible 90s children's toy sound that's like everything is a laser gun right yeah they make really <laughs> lo-fi sound effects when you swing them and you can't turn it off, so it's just the whole table is just this constant sound. Get in arguments whether or not that was a swing. No, I was just picking up the sword. Well, you it made the swing sound. You got to go with that wrong. No, I want to swing it. Ugh. I wasn't and swinging then... it for real. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I love this idea. And then just put the video on, on Kickstarter and like see if anybody gives to it. <laughs> It'd be so easy to make if you just put a little Arduino and a seven segment in there. Oh man, that's actually, right. this is, it's still a terrible idea, but it's a great idea. Right. The engineering is easy though. And that's what really counts. Yeah, who exactly. cares about, yeah, yeah. who cares about suitability for market? What counts is the engineering. <laughs> Precisely. I'm glad you understand. So many people don't get that. So many quote unquote business guys. Yeah, with their money and their suits and stuff. What do they know <sighs> about markets and things? Bunch of money nerds. Well, we're out of topics, which means we've done a show. You know, we really do need to get some of these for the diecast. Do we? Do we, Paul? What will we use them for? Uh, you can you can write it off your taxes as a business expense. Oh, sold. We'll answer mailbags at random. I'll roll to, to answer mailbag questions. Although on weeks like this <laughs> when we only have two uh, and we answer both of them, I suppose not so big a deal. What if they sell a coin? Well, thanks to both of you folks who sent us questions. If you have a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Uh, so send us some questions and we'll probably answer them. Or maybe not. Or maybe we'll roll dice. You don't know. Try it and see. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say, see you next week, Paul. See you next week, Seamus. ending so hard right i guess you figured that out with your book <laughs> and suddenly everybody was run over by a truck that's how that's how the die cast needs to end every week everybody can choose between a red green and blue ending oh no the star child conundrum right he'll come out and he'll ask you a dumb question with no answer and then you pick a color and he says you lose and that's the end of the show can we have Isaac, render out three different versions of the show. And like, you can listen to the, the red ending version, or the blue ending version, or the green ending version. I volunteer him to do that. I'm sure he'll be glad to do that, and he will find it no bother at all, and he doesn't mind the extra work. 